Hello everybody and welcome to our weekly Monday early comics review video. I'm Jason. I'm Andy. And we're with Infinity Flux Comics out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, where every Monday after our comics have been delivered and we've bagged and boarded them, we sit down, we read through them, we find out what all the where all the first appearances are. I was about to say, what all the fuss is about. What's all the fuss about? We find out things? what all the fuss is about. <laughs> We uh, we give a particular eye to issue number ones. We like to read them and tell you guys what they are about in sort of a spoiler light way. You know, we're going to tell you the major first appearances, things like that. But we're mainly going to tell you what these books are about so that when you go to your store on Wednesday, you're not just overwhelmed with so many choices. Mm -hmm. So you can see we already have some of the bigger ones here. I think we're gonna be reviewing 28 different comics that are releasing Tuesday and Wednesday and all their variants. So if you wonder why our video is a little lengthy, you know, we spend <laughs> two to three minutes on a book, that's yeah. gonna still add up when we do 28 of them. Uh, so yes, last week some of our books were delayed and late. We didn't get to do our full review. This week, it's all good. Mm -hmm. They are 99% all here, which is good for comics. <laughs> yes. So we're going to go through pretty much all of them. Andy, why don't you start us out? Yeah, I am starting out with Dark Crisis number three. So this is, how long is this? Seven issue series. So we're roughly at the halfway mark. I feel like uh, when you have seven issues, you have three and then three, and then seven is like the, the wrap-up issue or the, you know, the big fight or whatever it's going to be. Um, and usually I pick a number one for my featured one, uh, just because, you know, it's a good thing to jump off with. But I really enjoy this issue. I don't know what the general consensus online or with people is, how they feel about Dark Crisis, but I've really enjoyed it. It definitely uh, has the feeling of a DC event book. It brings in a lot of characters. I don't 100% know uh, Pariah, who is the big villain in this. I roughly know what his plan is. I don't really know uh, how he's going to go about it. But, so in this issue, we um, we pick up with Deathstroke. Now, we know that Deathstroke has been really uh, worse than usual. Deathstroke's already a bad guy, but he's been, like, extra bad in this. Um, he's kind of put out a call over every wavelength that if someone uh, acts as a superhero, um, he's basically just going to hunt them down, either him or his people. And without the Justice League there, you know, it's up to the, the lower tier heroes, and they're not quite as confident. So you see them going off in different directions because they don't quite have someone to rally under, anything like that. Meanwhile, Darks or if you want to say Dark Side, Black Adam uh, is going to train this new Justice League team that Jonathan Kent put together. He wasn't too impressed with it in the last issue. Um, you know, it's made up of Blue Beetle and Booster Gold, Harley Quinn, uh, uh, Killer Frost, um, Damian Wayne. It's a it's a very hodgepodge team, and. Black Adam's looking over it, and he's not super impressed with how it's going. So uh, you'll have to read to see what what he does about this. But for people saying, like, oh, why would Black Adam do this? And, oh, Black Adam's the new leader of the Justice League. Read this issue, because uh, the way it ends, you'll definitely see uh, what Black Adam's plan is uh, when he doesn't necessarily like the Justice League team he's got. Um uh, some of the other things in this, uh, there is some great uh, stuff with the Titans after Beast Boy got shot, and we don't quite know the state he's in. We know he's alive, he's going to survive, but it says, you know, he's going to have some lasting effects from this. We get great, like, reuniting of the Titans from a bunch of different eras, all meeting at the hospital to talk about what's going on. Uh, but this issue is not all doom and gloom because uh, there is a <clears throat> conversation between Jonathan and Damien where Jonathan is basically saying, we need the Justice League because they represent hope. And Damien says, well, maybe that's what got them killed. Uh, but then <clears throat> it's kind of not a spoiler because it is literally the, the panel is on one of the variant covers. Uh, someone says, you know, uh, we can't give you a league, or, yeah, we can't give you a league, but what about a society? And I think that is 
makes me really excited for what's coming up in this series. Um, some really cool stuff in this. Uh, in the previous issues, you saw that uh, how Jordan got Kyle Rayner out of this prison, and now the Green Lantern Corps are a major part of this. I love seeing that because it's been a while since we've seen just the full might of the Green Lantern Corps together. Uh, we see them going to hunt down Pariah. This this really feels like one of those event books where there's battles on multiple fronts, and it's really cool to see. Um, the other big thing about this book is it is said in a lot of places that this is the first appearance of a character called, I believe it's Red Canary? Red Canary, yeah. Red Canary. You'll even see her on the cover of one of the variants. Now, uh, if you're looking for a first appearance, I will say this is as hardcore first cameo as you can get. As in, you <clears throat> aren't even, I mean... If you knew that that character was coming up, like if she was on the variant like she is, you, you can spot her. Um, if, you, if we didn't have that, you would not know who this person is or even what their costume would look, would look like because you basically only see their eye. Their eye with a little bit of the mask around it. Andy showed me one panel, one panel. eye. First page, no, one no, panel. No dialogue. No dialogue. So uh, this is hard in the... Uh, first cameo uh, category and not first appearance. But if you're looking for first cover appearance, we have probably the best version of those you can get with a concept art uh, cover. So, great issue of Dark Crisis. I'm really looking forward to how this is going to go, especially bringing in some of the characters that this one did. So, this is our A cover. See with a lot of the Green Lanterns there. Here is one of the ones that I was telling you about. This is a direct panel, or actually page, from the issue. Love that one. That's by the interior artist, uh, Siempre. We have the Lee Weeks cover. We have the Mike Allred cover, which is really fun. And then here is the Dan Mora uh, sketch or, or concept art variant with Red Canary. So I only knew it was her in the book because I could see her little domino mask. It was red, and I, I matched it up. So that, what Andy is holding is first cover appearance Red Canary. Yeah. Inside the book is first cameo in one very close-up panel. It's a very weird thing to have a cover that shows more than the interior does of a character. You know, usually it's like a silhouette, and you're like, oh, they're going to reveal in this. This is the opposite. So, so more than likely, Dark Crisis number four will be first full appearance. I think so. Um, Why they decide to have her eye in this issue alone. I mean, I could even see maybe the next one also could be a cameo if it's not till maybe the last page she shows up, because it's not like she's put on any forward momentum to appear soon. Right. Uh it just kind of talks about, um, you know, new heroes. I like that character design. I though. mean, it's a beautiful it's character really design. Dan Mora, awesome art. So I highly recommend this cover. Um, for And if you're looking for a cover appearance. We also have some incentives. So this is the uh, Jiang 1 in 25 incentive that we are selling to our customers for $20. We've got the... 1 in 50, Ethan Young variant. That's kind of your new Justice League team on there. We're selling to our customers for $35. And we have our 1 in 100 foil variant of basically the A cover, but without the title, uh, by Siempre that we are selling to our customers for $100. I was admiring that one earlier. It, it does look really good. really good in foil. Especially the, the, the Green greens, Lantern, I would The greens say. with the foil really work well. Yeah. Okay, so I, too, am starting not with an issue number one <laughs> and with a DC book because wow. I think this is one I really wanted to read and I think a lot of people have been highly anticipating. It is Batman issue 126. So this is the second issue by the new creative team of Zdarsky and Jimenez. And let's look at the cover. It says, Fall of the Dark Knight. Not with a question mark, but an exclamation point. And there Batman is on the cover, bloodied with Nightwing sort of looking over him. 
So yes, yeah, something like this does happen in this, but let's back up a minute. Last issue, a new villain named Failsafe, who appeared to be a robot, was let out of wherever it was from. <laughs> we, we're still trying to figure out what the origin it came off of its charging of Failsafe port. is from. Yeah. <laughs> So Failsafe appeared, and in this issue, Failsafe is hunting down Batman. Make no mistake. It's not, because I was wondering, is it going to go where Failsafe is just doing things that Batman doesn't like and he gets in his way? No, that's not it at all. Failsafe is going after Batman, trying to hunt him down. They have quite the battle. It is such a battle in this issue, it draws in the rest of the Bat family. Mm. So it's not just Nightwing. It is a bunch of Bat family members who come to his aid. I'm not going to tell you how it exactly goes, but I will say the cover is a bit self-explanatory. <laughs> Failsafe is a very, very tough villain. However, um, it's not answered entirely in this issue as to where is Failsafe from. You learn a lot more. Some of you might even really figure it out by the end to some degree. Andy and I were sort of discussing it. I brought up by the end of this issue, Batman has sort of a a former outfit that we haven't seen in a long time. When you showed and... it to me, I got real excited because it's a thing I really like uh, from from Batman of the past. Yeah, so um, so there's that in there. Um, so that's a lot of the issue. A lot of the issue is high action to show you what exactly Fel Safe can do up against Batman and the Bat family. Now there's also the backup story where Catwoman is looking for the heirs to Oswald Cobble Potts' fortune because the Penguin is dead as of last issue. And he has left all his money to a bunch of children we never knew he had. <laughs> um, okay, well, I, there's a lot of surprises in that story. I can't tell you. But what I will say is you have the first appearance of Aiden and Addison Cobblepot, who claim to be related to Penguin. They claim to be children of Penguins. So first appearance of Aiden and Addison Cobblepot. Um, I feel know. like I could look at them and tell. I feel like he's got strong enough features that would have carried over in the in the bloodline. Yeah, funny enough, one of them, I was thinking the same thing. One <laughs> of them I see maybe a little bit, but the other one not at all. And when I mean a little bit, the whole thing could be made up. I, yeah. I, not, not a lot, because you're right, <laughs> Penguin. Uh, I think they uh, hopefully took a, uh, took a lot more off of their mom <laughs> than their dad. They don't come out with monocles was. and they squawk and, and stuff. <laughs> Um, so that, that's what's going on in there, but of course things aren't that simple. It's not just, oh, here is heirs, that's it. There is murder most foul going on, <laughs> and Catwoman is not just stepping aside. She has a chance to take a check and walk away. She is not going to do that, so that storyline is going to continue. Really good B storyline. So another excellent issue of Batman by the new creative team with some really good variants I'm happy to show. So the first variant... Here is the Garner variant. Then we have this really awesome yeah. March McFarlane homage variant with Failsafe there. Just looks like he's beating the snot out of Batman. You'll have to read the issue to see how accurate that is. <laughs> then uh, here is the Janin swimsuit cover yeah this We've been one waiting for this one yeah th this made some buzz online just batman in the bat trunks with <laughs> with the the uh mask still on i mean this is i i don't know what to say about this like it, it makes me want to laugh but at the same time it's really well done you feel like with uh gotham's climate and batman's propensity <laughs> to not go out in the sun that he would just burn he'd have the widest <laughs> most sensitive skin i mean if he has bat shark repellent surely he just has some That's sunscreen so <laughs> yeah and okay here are the incentives here's the one in 25 in hokali incentive we're selling That's to our cool. customers for 20 dollars while our supplies last then here is the jock foil variant this is the one in 50 we're selling for 45 dollars it looks even better in real life because of the foil and lastly here is the one in 100 ryan sook variant that we're selling for 75 dollars catwoman creeping on some people she's, she's spider manning yeah <clears throat> Okay, so next up for me, we have our next installment, kind of, in Peach Momoko's um, 
saga, uh, whatever you want to call it. It's the Momoko verse. It's the Momoko verse. So this is Demon Wars, the Iron Samurai number one. So I do love this cover. Uh, definitely an homage to Civil War number one with Captain America and Iron Man facing off. So if you read the previous uh, series slash series of one shots, uh, you know it ends up with our main character uh, Mariko got kind of thrown into modern day. So this this roughly picks up there. Um, I do think you could jump on right here and you know be fine, but she is having uh, some strange dreams. It seems like she doesn't quite remember all of that. She's having strange dreams that of course are uh, feudal Japan and full of uh, slightly familiar characters. I think that's what's interesting about Peach Momoko's um, universe, the Momoko verse, is it's not necessarily a one for one, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, like you'll be talking about, it's Spider Man, but he's a dinosaur. Um, these are a little bit more vague. So it's fun to kind of look at him and try to figure out, is that Professor X or is that uh, a lot of it said in colors and, uh, and interactions and stuff. So in this one, we do get uh, the Iron Samurai, you can see on the cover, which is a very cool design character. But we also get uh, what may be our villain of this. If you remember in the previous one, we got a very... Uh, uh, Venom-esque type dragon creature. Well, if there's a Venom, there's probably going to be a Carnage. So that's really cool. As well as a uh, Black Panther warrior character. So if you like the previous um, Mokoverse books, you will for sure enjoy this one. Uh, this one actually, I feel like this one's going to be a little bit more linear, which I'm not upset about. It'll be a little bit easier to follow. So that is Peach Momoko's Demon Wars, The Iron Samurai number one. And you know this is, has a bunch of the variant covers. So we have, let's see, we've got the, of course Peach Momoko also does a variant. We have, I mean if it wasn't clear enough before, here's the Ramos variant that's just straight up looks like an old Civil War tie-in book. We have the Alex Maleev variant, the Iron Samurai. We have the Yagawa variant. We have the Girahiru variant. And it's almost like Hulkbuster Iron Man in this because it's so big. Uh, we also have the 1 in 25 Momoko variant that we are selling to our customers for $30. All right, speaking of Spider-Man as a dinosaur, I read <laughs> Edge of Spider-Verse number one. So this is a mini series that's leading up to another Spider-Verse event. Um, these Edge of Spider-Verses, you know, as they've done in the past with Edge of Spider-Verse, Edge of Venomverse, it tends to kind of show you all the players back in their world. You know, mm -hmm. it's not really about the event. It's more about here are the key people before the event. So right off the bat, I'm going to tell you this has two first appearances and a new costume. So the two first appearances the, are the first one is Spider Laird, who I'll tell you more about in a moment. And then the other one is Spider Rex. That's right. A dinosaur Spider-Man is in this book having their own story. And I'll tell you about that too. And then lastly, Arana gets a new costume. Do you see her in the bottom down there? Hmm. That is Arana's new costume. And you'll get to find out how that happens. So um, as stated, this is an anthology of four stories, each from the four different characters' worlds. So the first story is Spider Laird's story. That is spelled L-A-I-R-D. I don't know what that means, but I will say the character is <laughs> Scottish. This happens in the 1700s in Scotland. And somehow he's a spider character fighting, you know, bad tax collectors or something back then with his spider powers. 
it's not a very long story. You know, I think with this character, this one to give you the taste of this character, they, they weren't like, okay, let's write a real big one. So this is like maybe a four page story where you get to know this character. They do the, the dialect. Yeah. You're reading it. You're, you're, you're it's hearing, phonetic. yeah, you're hearing the Scottish accent and everything. So, um, that is the first new character. And of course they're going to get pulled into this new event. Mm. We don't know what it's going to be, but we do know that that is going to be one of the characters in this event. The next story is Arana's story, which is the longest one, and of course we know her from many different mm -hmm. miniseries and her own series in the past. Uh, in this, Madame Webb comes to her, and this is sort of the, the younger form of Madame Webb that we've seen in things. And uh, that's not the main story, though. Madame Webb kind of comes in towards the middle end. Arana's doing her own thing. You get to catch up with her, but Madame Webb does give her a new outfit. Um, that's where she gets the new outfit from, which cool. I think is a really awesome looking outfit. Mm -hmm. So if you if you collect kind of uh, costume hero outfits, you're gonna want that this issue. For Especially that for spider characters, I feel like those have been more hot lately. You know, armored Spider Man, and for a while the uh, the the suit with the arms, that armored Spider Man. Those are those are real hot. So I'd keep a lookout on those. Yeah, yeah. Um, the third story follows Spider Rex. <laughs> and yes, it is exactly how it sounds. It is a T-Rex back in a world where everything's a dinosaur. And these are dinosaurs that can talk to each other. You know, so he's getting attacked and he's having his own adventures. And he has this new spider power that he's trying to get used to. And let's just say by the end of his story, which is pretty short, he has to learn the whole with great responsibility <laughs> comes great yada, yada, yada. You know yeah. it. You get to see Spider Rex's version of learning that because he makes a big mistake that hurts people. Mm -hmm. uh, and lastly, we get a Spider Man noir story, which is great. It's done in the art style of the noir universe. Really cool story. We get to catch up on Spider Man noir. So these are the first four characters. The next issues will follow more characters. I think we'll be having more first appearances. But this is definitely not one to sleep on. These events are always big, and there's always at least one like standout character mm -hmm. that everybody's trying to find the first appearance on later. So that is what is going on in Edge of the Spider Verse number one. We have some variants to show you. The first one is the U variant with Spider <laughs> Rex. Yep. With the tights swinging. Don't think about it too much. Just go with it. <laughs> uh, the next one is the Bengal variant. Now, this is a connecting variant. So they're going to have a series of these you could put together to get all the different spider characters together. So this is one you may want to think about right now do you want them all because uh, stores we don't order <laughs> yeah numerous of all of these unless uh people tell us to then here is the scotty young variant scotty young's always sort of done his on these uh spider verse mm -hmm. things it's just sort of tradition at this point there is a blank variant make your own spider person that's right make yourself a spider person <laughs> if you want make yourself a t-rex spider person here is the one in ten Umberto design variant for Arana's new outfit. We're selling to our customers for 10 bucks. And lastly, another Arana cover by Ramos. That This is a 1 in 25 that we are selling for $30. Yeah, I like her new suit. It looks good, yeah. You know, sometimes you she see... She likes it too. Even she's commenting <laughs> on how great it is. It's like when you see certain... It's like when everyone saw Spider-Gwen's suit and they go, yeah, that's that's a solid design. Mm -hmm. Okay, my next one is Bloodborne, Lady of the Lanterns. Is that right? The Lady of the Lanterns. Yeah, I couldn't remember if it was plural or singular. So, this, of course, is a tie-in with... Uh, the video game universe. We've only had one game, but there's a second one coming up for Bloodborne, the uh, the Dark Souls esque Victorian era Lovecraftian horror uh, sensation. Now this one's really cool. This is written by Cullen Bunn, and I, I love that you know he writes horror like no other. He is a great horror writer and uh, keeps a lot of um, you know his horror is grounded in in people and kind of people within a horrible scenario so in this bloodborne story uh this is during kind of the early stages of this plague this this uh 
darkness that's sweeping over uh, Yarnum, and we see a young boy and girl who are uh, eagerly awaiting their father's return. He just went out to get kind of groceries or go out to get food. Um, but you can already tell from the beginning that their father is not coming back. Uh, they're looking out the windows and there's just horrible stuff going on. So uh, what happens when a man stumbles through their door, first thinking it's their dad, uh, but it's not, and after him is a giant werewolf. Well, we learned that this man's name is Barnabas Cade, and he is a hunter, kind of like you play as in the game. And he retells, uh, he tells to the kids kind of his backstory about um, the Lady of the Lanterns, a ghostly figure that kind of summoned him through the city. Uh, so I won't give away everything because there's a lot of twists and turns to what is the Lady of the Lanterns, who is this man, and also what causes him, you know, he's found a pretty safe place, what causes him to leave and go back out into the streets on a mission. You'll have to see, it's it's that mix of like horror, but uh, kind of the period piece of the Victorian era that Bloodborne has, it's just really great, the art is great. It's by Peter Kowalski, who's been doing a lot of the Bloodborne books. Um, just really good, so if you're a fan, definitely recommend. And if you've never played the game, I still think this is a really good one to get into. Uh, it's it's pretty new reader friendly. You just got to know that there's some bad stuff going on. Do you think this comic will link in with the upcoming game? I'm I'm wondering. Um, you know, there's a lot of of hunters in the game and stuff that you run across. And I was almost was at first I was like, do I know this one from the first game? And I, I don't. But I definitely think that some stuff in here. Now that they know about the new game, they may have given Colin Bunn some, some hey, here's some a couple of things we're going to be right. featuring. Because a lot of stuff in this is, is kind of specific. I even wonder if the part of the city that they're in, you may see in the game. But this is our A cover, our Yoon A cover. We have our, this is the uh, Kowalski variant, which is your interior artist. We've got our Abigail Harding variant. Very cool. See the werewolf in that one. And we have the worm variant. So super cool. If you're a fan of Bloodborne or you like that kind of uh, Lovecraftian horror, you definitely like this one. All right, so it was my pleasure to read issue number four of Twig. So in this, our main characters, uh, Twig and his companion Splat, they continue through the very creative worlds and backgrounds, meeting weird, strange characters created by Scott Young and Kyle Strom, which is what really sets this book apart, if anything. Just the environments, the characters, the setting, it's, it's just, it's wild, it's beautiful, it's really cool to see. So in this issue, Twig and Splat are going to gain a new companion friend. And not just gain a companion friend, they also ha get to try to help name this this <laughs> thing. You'll have to find out why doesn't it have a name and, and how does it come about. But by the end, it will be named and they have a new companion. Um, in addition to this, they have to ward off many different dangers. There's always, you know, just dangers all throughout this. If anything, I wish these books were a little bigger because mm -hmm. they'll hit a danger. I'm like, that's so awesome. But... It's like they deal with it, and it's like, okay, well, I understand they only had so much room yeah. to, to show what happened with this. I can imagine the rest, and if this ever gets turned into something else, there's a lot of material they can expand upon. Um, but at the same time, there is an older danger that might be coming back, sort of a surprise ending. And lastly, they um, there's a bargain that is struck that might help Twig, but it also might let out a very dangerous evil. So you'll have to read it to see what you think. But that's generally what's going on in Twig issue number four. Let's get to the variants. So the first one, this is a Scotty Young variant. He just wants to show, I guess, some of the really harsh weather con <laughs> conditions that Twig has to adventure through like he's, a, like he's a postal worker. Does this have one more issue? Is it five or six? I, I believe it's six. Okay. Here is the Peach Momoko variant. 
You would have never guessed from the style or all the eyes. <laughs> the eyeballs. So creepy. There's also a virgin version of that variant that is a 1 in 25 that we are selling for $45. And then Kyle Strom, the interior artist, did the 1 in 10 variant, the virgin version of that, which we're selling for $10. Okay, next up for me, we have a, uh, I believe this is only a two issue yes. micro yeah. series, I guess you would call it. Um, this is Batman, the White Knight, is it Presents? Presents. Yeah, White Knight Presents Red Hood. So this was kind of um, teased at the end of the previous issue of uh, White Knight Beyond, where it said, like, see the story in uh, Red Hood. Well, that is this story. And I really like this. Um, I, I'm kind of a little sad that it's only going to be two issues, but I think that's good. You know, he can pack it with the the best of the best. So this is by Sean Murphy, and the art is uh, uh, Demio is doing the art. So it's very luminous looking. Um, but what was really cool about this is in the White Knight universe, it picks up with the classic scene of Joker who has Jason Todd as Robin tied down. And traditional universe, that's when Jason Todd supposedly dies. Um, but this, we find out a little bit more. So Joker has the big question for Jason Todd, who is Batman? And Jason Todd says, Bruce Wayne. Well, that just makes Joker goes, huh, okay. And he cuts him free. Now, not a spoiler, uh, because that's really what sets up Jason Todd for this universe. Because if you gave away that Batman was Bruce Wayne, uh, there's no going back to Batman. Jason Todd is now scared because he did that and he goes on the run. So we see him through the years uh, doing different odd jobs. He still has his Robin training, kind of keeps up with all of his training. So this is kind of his evolution into what would eventually become Red Hood. But one day something's going down and he runs into a girl who is wearing a Robin costume. Now, it doesn't seem like she's necessarily um, Batman-sponsored Robin, but she kind of believes in the Robin ways and is trying to do good for her little community. And Jason Todd basically tells her that this is a really bad idea. Um, you're going to get hurt. And her name is Gan. And it seems like uh, Jason Todd may decide, instead of telling her to go on her way, it's like, well, if you're going to do this, I'm going to train you. So we do know from the, the current series going on that he had a partner at one time, and it looks like this is going to be the story of her. So this is the first appearance of Gan, who is a Robin, uh, maybe uh, Red Hood's Robin. So really cool, highly recommend especially if you're reading the White Knight Universe books. I think this is one of the one of the better ones. We also have a variant for it. This is the uh, Kuipel variant. Okay, so I read The New Champion of Shazam, number one. So this is a four-issue miniseries, and this is actually Mary Marvel's first solo series. She has never gotten to just wow. kind of be in her own series. She's always a part of the Shazam family. All right, so uh, this requires a little, a little backstory to fill in anybody who doesn't know about this. So not long ago, Billy Batson, he got locked up in the Rock of Eternity along with the, the Shazam power. And that took it away from all the Shazam family. Nobody has the power anymore. Billy Batson is gone. He is in the Rock of Eternity. That's all there is to it. Okay, so this takes place after all that happened. And Mary, it starts out kind of explaining who she is in her own mind and, and what she's gone through in her life. You know, she was an orphan. She's, um, you know, a... Uh, She's a daughter to her adoptive family. She's the older sister to the Shazam 
family and all the brothers. She's a little bit of a, a know-it-all, a little bit of an overachiever. It goes through all this and, and you know, all the things that make up who she is. She's, she also gets to be a superhero along with her family. But now she's about to start her freshman year at college. And she sees this as a real important step because for one thing, she's not going to college locally. She's going away. She's going to be on her own. She wants to figure out who she is. She's done with the super heroics. And even though it sucks that Billy is locked up in this, it has kind of freed her from having to give up her time to be a superhero. She wants to be a normal girl. She wants to go to college, make friends, all that. So about half of this is half of this first issue is that. It's a lot about her and what she hopes for and her first days as a freshman at college, meeting her new roommates, things of that sort. But of course it can't be that simple because there's also a certain uh, magical creature that shows up and tells her, guess what? Um, you need to take the power of Shazam. You need to take all the power because a new evil is rearing its ugly head. She doesn't necessarily want to do this. so. She, in this issue, she gets shown one example of the new evil and has to battle with it and do something about it. Um, but even after that, she is very hesitant. She does not want this. And this isn't her, this isn't the normal power she has. Usually she's sharing it with five people. This is all the power. So mm. she's real powerful when she takes this power. Um, so will she be able to be convinced to take this power or not? when she really, really doesn't want to. My bet is probably. I mean, otherwise, you know, I don't think the book's going to all be about <laughs> just her at college. But it does make for a much more interesting read that she's conflicted about this. So that's what's going on in the new champion Shazam, number one, first solo series for Mary Marvel. And we just have this one really awesome variant. Look at this Joshua Middleton variant. It's so nice. It's like he sat there and drew her while she was sitting there, you know, it's a yeah. portrait. That's cool, and I like that it's in continuity, you know, yes. kind of furthering it, the it Shazam is. lore. Yeah, it's, it's not, oh, this is a story from at some point. Yeah. It's like, no, this is happening Yeah, relatively current DC. Mm -hmm. Okay, my next one is a super fun one. This is Ghost Rider number five, and my... my Biggest thing about this is, even if you aren't reading this series, just pick up this issue because it is so much fun. That's what's been great about this Ghost Rider series. Every issue's kind of been a standalone tale, kind of another adventure of Ghost Rider. Uh, this one, I don't want to give away too much, but i got to give you enough to tell you why you need to pick it up. Um, so, Johnny Blaze is going to go on uh, the Hell's Backbone Rally. So this is a uh, the most dangerous kind of track that you can go on uh, as a motorcycle rider or whatever. And it's because there's like these two rocks. One looks like two horns and one looks like a tail. And so you've got to drive over the devil's backbone uh, from one end to the other. And uh, people do not survive it. Well, if you do survive it, if you do take on this rally and you win it, you get to meet, uh, I believe it's, let's see, you meet uh, the devil and he will grant you one wish. This doesn't sound good. <laughs> no, it does not sound good. But Johnny Blaze has been through a lot and he could really use a wish. You know, he's been s slowly being corrupted. He's got these things crawling all inside of him. He's got an eyeball on the back of his head. Uh, so he goes and it starts him kind of right at the uh, the starting line of this. But what makes this fun is this is the best I could describe is uh, the Marvel Universe meets Mario Kart because it is not only uh, Ghost Rider that's going to be running in this rally, but it's a lot of your favorite Marvel uh, villains and anti-heroes and they all have themed motorcycles to them. So just examples, you've got uh, Craven the Hunter, and the front of his motorcycle looks like the lion head that's kind of on his, on his vest. Uh, Doctor Doom is racing in this race. Wolverine is racing in this. Uh, Moon Knight, Daredevil. Uh, this is like Mario Kart, where they all have their theme bikes, 
and they are uh, they're going to be fighting each other as they run this race. It has loops. It has uh, you know crazy curves that go on, and we just get scene after scene of different uh, characters on their motorcycles facing off, trying to get to this wish. Uh, at first, I was like, "There's no way this is real. These are all probably demons, and he's having a, a terrible dream." But it actually seems like this is real because going forward, I believe the next issue is uh, Johnny Blaze teamed up with Wolverine that comes out of this story. So this is just super fun. Uh, this could have easily been a standalone issue and can be completely worth it. But of course, if you've got this devil that's standing there at the end ready to grant a wish, uh, you know it's not that easy and there's more to it uh, when this creature, this thing, pulls its hood back. You'll learn a little bit more about where this Ghost Rider series is going. Uh, I just thought this was a blast. I, I, when you, there's a scene with all of them kind of at the starting line and you can just look through there and see all the characters with their bikes and uh, it's really funny who's there. So, highly recommend picking up Ghost Rider number five, even if you haven't been reading the issue, just for the fun fact of it's like Mario Kart. And I am out of the variant cover for this, so just got this one to show you. I have seen so much Twilight Zone, I know. Never make a deal with the devil, and don't take any wishes, <laughs> especially from the devil. All right, so I read Moon Knight issue number 14. So in this, we have an A story and a B story, but they're going on simultaneous in a way. So uh, our A story is that Mark Spector is having a little meeting of the minds within his own mind with the other parts of his mind. So it's Mark Spector uh, talking with Stephen Grant and Jake Lockley, his other personalities, because Stephen and Jake both think that Mark has a bit of a problem he doesn't want to agree with them about at all. Uh, they, they think, you, you just have to read it for yourself. You could, if you've been reading the series, <laughs> you probably even know what they're going to say in a lot of ways. Um, but while this mean of the minds is going on, we get to see in the background um, of the same panels or interlace between the panels, Moon Knight is getting attacked by the Stature, and that's the group of vampires who he's been hunting. But as of last issue, they brought in some heavy, two, two new uh, heavy villains to, to fight him. So Moon Knight is fighting these villains the whole time he's having this meeting. And I have to say, um, Mark Spector trying to argue, argue doesn't go very well, <laughs> nor does the battle. Uh, both, both the argument and the battle by the end of the issue end up in, in a very bad, pretty dire position. And so that's generally what's going on in Moon Knight number 14. And that's some of why Moon Knight is cool. You know, the, the people who read Moon Knight like it, it's like, we want that. We want this like, yeah. psychological, you know, um, tug of war that goes on within Moon Knight and how that affects the world. Because really, Moon Knight is super powerful. Um, he, he really is one of the more powerful heroes and mm -hmm. great fighters. So, you know, his, his, the thorn in his side is himself. Yeah. And his different sides and, and what he does to himself. So here is the Yildirim variant for Moon Knight. Oh, red and blue, web swinging Moon Knight. Yep. <laughs> okay, next up I have Spawn issue 332. Uh, no, not a whole lot to say here, but uh, we do finally see a throwdown between Spawn, Al Simmons, and uh, Cog, or now he's called uh, Sin with two N's. Uh, we see the big fight between them, and it looks like we may be building towards a Spawn versus Spawn war fight with different people on different sides. You'll have to read it to find out but uh, another good issue of Spawn, and we are currently out of the variant. So that is Spawn. All right, here's a really interesting indie book I read. So this is Golden Rage, issue number one. So just take a look at the cover. You know, what do you think this is about? You know, Golden Rage sounds sort of like the Golden Girls, and here you have, you know, some 
some woman's older hand. You can just sort of tell with some of the wrinkles. And the bracelet says grandma. But they're bloodied. <laughs> so, you know, when I heard of this book and I saw the cover, I thought, okay, it's like Golden Girls, but some sort of fight club. Yeah. It, I think they said uh, Go uh, Golden Girls meets Hunger Games. I okay. think is their original pitch for it. So, you know... Older women fighting is what the cover suggests, which is just a very different sort of story. We don't see that a lot in comics. So this starts out, and you're on an island, and you're following um, our main protagonist, who has just arrived at the island, but it doesn't seem like she quite knows everything about how she got there. Mm -hmm. Like, she definitely knows her backstory. It's not like she has amnesia or anything. Mm -hmm. But it seems like she's been under duress in a way that has addled her to where maybe she doesn't know exactly how she got there, even though it does seem like she knows why. Yeah. Um, and she is on the island. There's a battle going on at night um, with fires raging, and it does appear to be a lot of older women fighting. Well, this one really big older woman pretty much saves her, brings her back to her little tribe of three, and um, this is where we kind of learn who our main characters are, what their names are, what they're like. But even by the end of the issue, we don't have all the whys. We don't know why are they all on this island. We get the hint it has a lot to do with society sort of discarding them mm -hmm. and seeing them as not important anymore, possibly having to do with um, them being too old to give birth to children. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not useful anymore. That, that, yeah. is, that is definitely sort of discussed a bit. But a lot of this is sort of, you're, you're learning the character, you're learning the setting, and you've got to be interested enough to want to read the next one. It's not all just given mm -hmm. to you in the first issue. Um, our main character is very distrustful of these people. Um, she's a lot younger than them, so you get to find out why maybe she's there too. So that's generally what's going on in Golden Rage number one. I thought the art was really good. I thought the story was told in a, in a very good way. I, I wish it started with a double issue. Yeah. I, I wanted a little more of, okay, well, also why. Mm -hmm. um, they're apparently afraid of some group called the Red Hats who are coming to attack them. That's sort of where things end up. Um, but check this one out. This is a strong, independent comic. It's a sort of thing you would definitely never see at Marvel or DC. It, it definitely feels like a story somebody has to tell that I haven't heard before. Yeah, I read this one too, and uh, I would say it was less... It could easily go the comedic direction, and it doesn't. It does yeah. have It does have humorous parts, but it's kind of set up pretty seriously, the, at least the situation they're in. You know, there's some funny stuff said, and, and just kind of, you know, the, the ladies have a lot of cats and that kind of thing. So that's fun. But I was like, oh, this is actually like a pretty strong story, a pretty strong setup for something, you know, with little hints of maybe what's going on, like the red hats. They almost seem like they're kind of the, uh, the stormtroopers here. They're kind of the ones that keep the peace, you know, or keep people where they're supposed to be in this island. And this issue has a, uh, a map at the end of it that's right. pretty fun that shows some spots on this island with one of the uh, grandmas telling you about each of the spots on the island. And I thought that was really fun. Yeah. And there is a variant for it. It's a Lotte variant. However, um, we were shorted ours. So I don't have it to show, but there is a Lotte variant for Golden Rage number one. When you said we got 99% of our stuff in, that's in the 1% that we didn't get yep. in. But we will. Okay, next up, I have a new number one. This is Sword of Azrael, Say Your Prayers. This is a six-issue miniseries. And this actually kind of goes in tandem with this one. This is Sword of Azrael, Dark Knight of the Soul. So this collects um, a storyline that was in Batman Urban Legends that leads into this one. So it's the uh, same writer, Waters, that is doing it. Uh, so I... It's hard to say if I feel like you need to have read this one, but it definitely helps uh, get you in the place of what Azrael is currently doing uh, and kind of what he's been through recently. Because when this one picks up, uh, John Paul Valley does not want to be Azrael anymore. He wants to put that behind him. 
uh, it's kind of a very uh, tormented spirit that's in him when he kind of releases the Azrael persona. And so he has gone to a monastery to, you know, live a life of peace and tranquility. That is until a um, very biblical angel appears to him. You know, this isn't your uh, fluffy wings and white robe. No, this is a very scary, multi-winged, multi-eyed angel comes to him with a message that kind of brings him back into the fold. Uh, while his monastery is getting attacked by uh, the return of Vengeance, Bane's daughter Vengeance, who we didn't really know where she was going to go after uh, Joker, but it looks like this is one of her stops on her way. So uh, it, this is definitely a setup issue of bringing Azrael back into, you know, you've got to pick up the flaming sword again and go at it. Uh, and there is a new character in this, um, as far as I can tell, always, you know, there could, it could be a very random uh, other book that they appear in, but they, they're introduced in this one, and their name is uh, the Angel Sariel, and you'll have to see how they're very similar to Azrael in this, uh, and it looks like he may have a new partner or a frenemy, we'll have to see going forward what that's going to be, but that is... Sword of Azrael, Say Your Prayers, number one. And if you want to get completely caught up, check out Dark Knight of the Soul, Sword of Azrael. Both are very good, and we have variants for both of them. So this is the variant for regular Sword of Azrael. This is the Christian Ward variant. And we have the variant for Dark Knight of the Soul. This is the uh, Ba variant. All right, one book I'm always looking forward to read every week, or every month rather, <laughs> soon every week, is Harley Quinn. I read Harley Quinn number 18, so it says, Harley Quinn to infinity. Harley Quinn is going to space. So this says, Task Force XX Part 1. And um, it's funny, so I, you know, Andy reads half the comics, I read half the comics, you know, we don't have time to read them mm -hmm. all, um, but afterwards we often read the same stuff. And you were talking about Dark Crisis and the Justice League being put together and Harley being on it. Let me just say, um, based on what happens in this, because it definitely refers to all that, you want to read Dark Crisis 3 before you read this, if you're reading both. There is a panel where she's doing something I think related to that issue. So yeah, if you're reading both, read the Dark Crisis three. Now, if you're not reading Dark Crisis, it's fine. You know, you'll you'll get what's going on in this. So um, Harley is going to space. Why? Because basically, all the other heroes or are dead or dealing with Deathstroke, and she is approached by an ex-hero who is very rich. That's the most I can tell you on that. And he um, wants Harley to join a team, sort of lead the team, I believe, to go to the moon where there is some element from another universe that has that is mutating in a terrible way, in a very unpredictable way. Um, now, I think the most interesting part to this is who is the rest of the team? You know, if everybody's busy with Deathstroke or dead, who are these other people? There's six of them. And what I can tell you is one of them is a character who's been in this Harley series who I think a lot of you will be very surprised to see again. Uh, I was. I was like, wow, oh, okay, cool. And then one of the other ones, Harley gets to pick out a character. Like she, She's like, I'll do it, but I want somebody I trust. So she puts somebody on the team. And the only hint I'll say is it's not Kevin. That would be too easy if it was just, you know, oh, it's Kevin, you know. No, it's somebody with superpowers. So I really like the team they build in this. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested to see where it goes. Um, very cool setup issue. They just make it in the space. So mostly this is putting it together. Also, this issue has a lot to do with what Harley thinks about teams in general. Mm -hmm. She's been on a lot of teams, yeah. but is she really a team player? Her thoughts on it are great. Um, th this series really found its stride a while back, and it just keeps it up. Good writing, you know, cool art, just hardly doing awesome things, being the great character that she is. 
So we got some variants for it. Here is the Derek Chu variant for it. And then this is the Sook homage variant. So they're doing a series of these homage variants to pass Batman covers where Harley's sort of taking them over. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, the first one. So um, you're going to want to get these all if you like this one. I'm definitely grabbing them all. Um, I also wanted to mention that Harley is becoming a weekly series through this event. So I, I always like when that happens for a yeah. while with a comic that I really enjoy like this. I don't know how the team got ahead like this, <laughs> but it is weekly for the next, like, I guess, five weeks maybe? Mm -hmm. so. For this storyline at least. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's where all the variants are for this storyline mm -hmm. uh, through the different time frames. So next up, one to briefly mention, it is the final issue of Star Wars uh, Galaxy's Edge Halcyon Legacy that's been kind of going through time as a droid tells a young girl stories about the different things that have happened on the Halcyon ship that is also just happens to be a hotel in Florida. Uh, and this one uh, mainly deals with Bosk and the Bounty Hunters. Uh, not necessarily a lot of other bounty hunters you recognize, but what I will say in this is uh, possibly the first appearance. I dug deep because I know the character, um, but she has been in books and has there's literal actors that play her at Galaxy's Edge, and that is um, Vi uh, Marathi, who is kind of the the created character for um, Batu and Disney, but she's been a now a fan favorite character. She was on a variant cover. She was on the Pride Month variant cover for Mandalorian, but I believe this is her first in comic appearance. And you know, it's kind of a big deal because she's already been in quite a bit and is a very um, supported character in the universe. So not in it very much, but uh, I believe this would be her first appearance. So we have, this is our A cover. We have our, let's see, Gia Giordano variant. And we have our Sliny Connecting variant. All right, I read Spider-Man 2099 Exodus number five. And the cover tells you a lot of what this is about. There is a new X-Men 2099 team in this book. Here's their first cover appearance, their first full appearance, team appearance is in the book. There are 11 different characters, mm. and one of them is a first appearance. One I've never seen before. I think the other 10 I do recognize or know from other books for the most part. Um, so uh, like the other Spider-Man 2099 Exodus books, all of them have been more about these new 2099 mm -hmm. characters. You know, it's like, oh, it's Winter Soldier 2099, but you don't just meet them. The whole issue's about them. And then at the end, you see how it figures in to uh, Miguel's, what's yeah. going on with Miguel. So in this, the, the X-Men 2099 are introduced, and the, the book is about them. They're trying to find a new place to call home. Okay, they don't have a home for certain reasons. They think they found the spot. But of course, they get attacked by Sentinels 2099. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yes. Just can't I mean, get that, rid of that, them. That's, that's just going to happen. You know how it is. So there's a lot of battling with that. And in the end, it looks like they're going to end up teaming up with Miguel to go up against the Green Goblin and the Cabal next issue. So I have to say, I thought Miguel was going to have to fight, face the Cabal on his own. But now he's got the X-Men 2099 yeah. with him. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. That's a lot more firepower and a lot more help. So here, let's see, the variant, oh, here it is. The variant for it, here is the Ken Lashley variant with the border that he has been doing for all these issues. Is that X-Man? Um, no, that is not x -Man. Okay, you're talking about... The big one, the big one on the cover. Oh, the big one on the cover? No, that is not. Oh, man, I'm it looks like him with the was. white hair and the, with the glowy eye. Maybe they've renamed him. Because, mm. oh, uh, it's not. It's Cable. Oh. Yep, that is Cable. So, he's still, he's still young Cable. They joke about it. They're like, 
they're like blah 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 young cable but you're not as young as you were but you know he's still not as old as wow. the original cable so that's interesting yeah okay so one just very briefly mentioned we have uh james tynan's the closet number three is out this is the final issue it's just a three-part series i think it's uh they're still a little bit oversized so if you were enjoying that you have the final issue coming out this week. Okay, so next one I'm going to go over another independent book. This one from Dark Horse. This is Survival Street number one. Okay, so this is set in the year 2031 where businesses have privatized in such a way that they're now seen as individuals mm -hmm. so they can run for office. So what happens when businesses can run for office? Well, they take all the money they usually lobby with, and instead they lobby for themselves. And so I think 80, in this says 83% of all um, political positions are taken over by businesses. They then get rid of public everything. They privatize it all. So um, basically business runs everything. Mm -hmm. And because of that, TV shows like, say, things that would resemble Sesame Street, <laughs> um, because, you know, they certainly don't say that in this book, they get canceled and the world turns into a very bad place, even worse for children who are defenseless. So these out of work characters who are puppets, OK, this is a world where puppets live and talk. They're, they're seen as sort of second class citizens. They band together and they get tough. And they go out to, to fight for what they think is right and try to protect kids. Um, you know, so they call themselves the ABC gang. Characters who on their show used to be called Corporal Fairness. He's now Corporal Punishment. <laughs> you know, um, what I would say about this is it, it's not as, like, silly as I thought it would be. It leans a little bit more into it's being serious. Yeah. So if that appeals to you, if you want it to be a little more serious, then you'll like it. If you're looking for it to just be total tongue in cheek silliness, that is not what this is, at least not in the first issue. You know, there's definitely stuff you're going to laugh at, but it, it, it tries to keep that hard edge. So, I mean, to me, I think the cover is a good representation of it. I think if you look at the cover and you think, you know, hey, cool, you know, this is the sort of thing I want to see them them doing. I think you'll like it because it's a it's about as harsh slash funny as the cover. Yeah. Really. So that's what's going on with Survival Street number one. And we have this is the variant. This is the Dewey variant. And it kind of shows on the one side they were all happy and then up oh, now they're in the post-apocalyptic business is taken over world so that is the dewey variant to survival street they're almost in the world of like the the muppet movie where the muppets were are just another people in this world and everybody knows they exist everything that's kind of how the the um the felt people in this are yeah you know and that's been done other things like happy time murder yeah you know okay next up i have Flashpoint Beyond number four. So we only have, I believe, yeah, two issues left of this. Feels like it just got started. And uh, so in this one, we have um, Oswald Cobblepot. It's funny you were talking about him earlier. In this universe, he's almost the Alfred character. He's kind of uh, works for Thomas Wayne, and he is currently babysitting uh, Dexter Dent who I, he's been doing it through the past few issues. There's some places that say, oh, it's the first appearance. It's not. He was in previous issues. Um, he does something different in this, but just like any uh, kid under the care of Bruce Wayne or Thomas Wayne, under the care of a Wayne, uh, he sneaks away because he is going to try and get his mom out of Arkham. Now, his, his mom in this is the Two-Face character. We know that from way back in the Flashpoint universe. Um, but it's still his mom, and he's going to try and break her out. He's only like maybe eight or nine years old at most. It's hard to tell, but he is very young. Uh, and apparently they leave the door to the Batcave unlocked, and he goes down there and equips himself and heads out. 
So part of this is Thomas Wayne and Oswald trying to figure out where he went and what for. But also at the same time, we have Bruce Wayne, who really through this entire series hasn't left one room. He's been there talking to uh, another time travel character and it's loosely being narrated by him. This is very high concept, uh, multiverse, omniverse, space time, uh, you know, that kind of sci-fi talk in this issue. But the main thing about it is, uh, as Thomas Wayne was investigating uh, the body of Reverse Flash, he found just like a lot of them, he was full of gears. And this is why they call whoever the killer is the clockwork killer. Uh, and he, and the very Batman way, has uh, figured out that you've got to put these gears together somehow. And that will, will reveal who the, the killer is. So we'll say, in this book, it seems that Bruce Wayne and Thomas Wayne on separate Earths figure it out at the same time. And it's a very horrifying revelation for them and incredibly personal to them. So I did not see this direction coming. I'll have to read the next one to really see what this means, because if this is true for, you know, our main universe Batman, this really shakes up stuff, uh, you know, even back to uh, why he became Batman type thing. So pretty big stuff, but we're definitely gonna have to wait till the next issue to see how it plays out. So that is Flashpoint Beyond number four. And then we have this super cool, and I wish we've seen these characters in this, but we have not seen them yet. This is the 1 in 25 Chiang variant that we are selling to our customers for $20. Very upset because uh, down here is Canterbury Cricket. He's one of my favorite characters of the Flashpoint universe, and he has not appeared in this yet. And he is just a giant cricket man, and I love him. All right, so I read Poison Ivy number three. This is more of Poison Ivy on her road trip where she is trying to infect enough humans with this fungal virus to hit critical mass before the very same virus kills her. Um, she reveals in this issue, you know, she's dying from it too because ultimately she too is human, but she has a healing factor, mm -hmm. so it's taking a long time. So. While, you know, she has this time, she's going to go out and try to infect as many people as she can. Well, in this issue, Ivy realizes, hey, I don't have a whole lot of money. I need money for this road trip. It always makes me laugh in comics when there are characters who are, like, super powerful and they have trouble getting money. Yeah. You know, like, Ivy's already killed people in this comic. I don't really understand why can't she kill someone and just, like, take money from a cash <laughs> register or something. But anyhow, that aside... She uh, ends up, there, there's a hotel manager where she's staying who needs help with her overgrown garden. No, oh, perfect. So, yeah, I mean, I think Ivy might know some things about this. So this issue, she helps somebody with a garden. Uh, but during this whole thing, she is waxing in her mind, feeling guilt about what she's doing, but ultimately deciding, I'm still going to do it. She has mental and dream conversations with Harley, stuff like that. So that's what's generally going on in Poison Ivy issue number three. A lot of really good variants for this, though. Mm -hmm. I really like the art to this series. So here is the Joshua Middleton variant. This is a hard one to pick the, your favorite. Yeah. I mean, right off the bat, it's easy to go, oh, that's probably the best one. It might be. You know, I think it's all, all to taste, though. Here is the Joel Jones variant. And was this, uh, this the swimsuit, swimsuit variant? So this is yeah, the swimsuit variant. Then we have this really awesome art germ variant. Just a whole different way for her to look when she's more, you know, a part of the green yeah. than she is human. Then we have, here is a 1 in 25 Franey variant. We're selling to our customers for $25. Do you think this is going to, uh, is she going to eventually turn good at the end of this? It seems like, uh, how many issues is this? I forget. This is a, at least a six issue series. I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you what's going to happen. I don't know if she's going to get to the end and still be a villain or is she going to 
turn good or is Harley actually going to find her? I don't know. I don't know where this series is going. I, I guess that's a strong point about I'd it. I'd be surprised if Harley shows up. I don't think Harley is looking for her, mm. you know, so. Okay, next up. This is kind of a representative of a few X-Men books that come out this week, like Immortal X-Men, but this is X-Men Red, and I feel like this is the important one to talk about because if you read uh, Avengers X-Men Eternals number one, then this kind of pertains the most to it. As you can see, it's a tie-in issue. We've got Cable on there, who uh, is just a skeleton and with a melty giant gun. So this uh, takes place during that time period in issue one of Acts, where, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Uranus is laying waste to Mars, where all the X-Men are. And we get to see that from the X-Men's perspective, or the mutants' perspective. And it kind of has a countdown to the moment it happens, and then a countdown after it. Uh, kind of post that how long it's been and we really see what kind of fight the mutants are able to put up against it and I think more importantly uh, who actually survived this attack on Mars and it looks like one character uh, that definitely looked like they died did not die but have been they're doing something very weird to keep themselves alive that I'm not sure what it is but uh, they are now on a, uh, a tear for the Eternals. They are going to hunt them down. So it looks like we're really building up the, uh, the tension in this, this event with X-Men Red number five. All right, so I read Iron Man issue number 22. So the climax of last issue was that Iron Man and Rhodey learn that their long-term sort of associate, kind of a friend at points, Vic Martinelli had been killed. And this has something to do with these advanced weapon dealers that uh, Tony's been trying to find out about. And um, so this issue, Tony and Rhodey, they do a bit more digging, a bit more trying to find out about these people. And uh, they get attacked by uh, a very powerful weapons person in a very powerful armored suit. So it is armored suit versus two armored suits <laughs> battle in this issue of Iron Man. And then something pretty tragic happens to Tony. However, maybe it's part of a long-winded plan. Hmm. You know, read it, see what you think. It's not all revealed by the end, but I have my ideas on, on where it's going from here. So that's uh, just a quick little review on what's going on in Iron Man 22. And then we have the Lozano variant. Is that the stealth armor? May appear at mm. some point in this issue. And yes, it is the stealth armor. And then here is the Baron's Predator variant for Iron Man 22. Very cool. Barons is doing a lot of the variants for and a covers for Spawn. So. Barons does a really good Predator. Yeah, yeah. Like, like almost, almost like photorealistic. Yeah, if there's one of the Spawn issues where it shows how he does it, and he basically builds digital models and everything. It's really interesting. Okay, one just to show off. We have finally Eight Billion Genies number one second printing. So if you've been waiting because you could not get that first printing because it shot up in price and your store sold out, here's your chance to read 8 Billion Genies, number one, fantastic series, uh, highly recommended, get on board with it because every issue just ups the, the, the storytelling, the humor, everything. So that is 8 Billion Genies, number one, second printing. Okay, so... We were the other book we were shorted is the A cover of this one. So this is the Sabatini B cover for a new image book called The Dead Lucky. So this series, yes, I thought that was an image. I said to double check myself. <laughs> okay, so this is set in the near future, and it follows a soldier who has recently come back from some sort of conflict. It's not completely clear what it was. 
And a lot of her fellow soldiers in her company didn't make it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she's got PTSD. She's having to get, you know, psychological help, all that. She's telling her psychiatrist how she's come back to the city, but the city has changed. It's not the place that she left. You know, the whole time she was gone, she was missing this place. She gets back to it. It's not even the place she remembers, and she's having trouble fitting in with it now. So the problem is, is the city's gotten worse in every way. Uh, crime is on the rise, and there is in particular one major gang that is sort of uh, controlling a lot of things. Well, she decides she's had enough of it, and she starts to take them on using what looks to be sort of like a mech suit. Um, you kind of see it in the cover. The main cover has a little more of it, I believe. And then the ending was a little unclear to me, but it looks like maybe she has some extra powers that relate to her fallen allies. Hmm. It was really unclear. It's one of these, like, right at the end, you know, here it is, but if we're not explaining. You'll have to read second issue. Um, and I think that relates to, you know, the fact it's called The Dead Lucky. Is this in the Radiant verse? Not that I know of. Okay. I couldn't remember I if this recall. was one of the ones that might be in that. What are they calling that now? The, the Massive Universe. The, the Massive Universe. It I, might be. Okay. Well, if if so, they they you know and they did this with uh, Radiant Red, where or no, not Radiant Red, Rogue Sun. Yeah. Where it was like you couldn't even tell. You could read it. Yeah. And it was just, yeah. I don't think it is, but well, you know, I'm glad you mentioned yeah. it. Might be part of the Radiant Verse. <laughs> I will look into that as soon as the show is over. Um, so yeah, so that's the B cover. We don't have the A cover for it. Here is the one in ten. Carlini variant that we are selling to our customers for ten dollars because I could definitely see that you know mm -hmm. in the art now that you're saying it but not a hint to any of the other radiant books yeah okay next up for me is the long titled book Black Adam uh, the Justice Society files cyclone number one this is our second of the one shots of some of the characters we're gonna be seeing in the Black Adam movie the first one was Hawkman. This one is Cyclone. So I feel like this is the character out of all of them. I don't know, Adam Smasher, people may not know a whole lot about. But Cyclone is, uh, you know, you got to be a deep cut person to know the backstory of Cyclone. And she's really cool. So her name is Maxine Hunkel. And she, in this, uh, is just, you know, living her life. Um, when all of a sudden there is a, uh, a big thing that attacks her street, her local neighborhood, and she is forced to reveal that she has powers uh, to stop it. And, you know, you would think, oh, that's cool and everything, but uh, it's a little too much attention for her. People are, are now starting to uh, kind of, you know, come to her in droves and, and want help and everything that she might not be cut out for. But that also has drawn the attention of Hawkman, who is going to confront her about this. So it's a really fun, just one-shot story. Um, you know, they're kind of getting you familiar with these characters. What I think is interesting is Maxine Hunkel. If you know in the original comics that the first Red Tornado was Ma Hunkel. And so she's part of the Red Tornado family. And, of course, her name is Cyclone. She has very similar abilities. I'm wondering, you know, maybe there's going to be a hint to uh, Red Tornado in the movie after reading this and seeing a little bit of it. I think it's pretty cool. So uh, there's also the backup story that's continuing about kind of jumping back and seeing the early days of uh, Black Adam when he was younger and then kind of relating that to current day and all of that. So... Really fun issue. I, I like the one shots. These are done very well. That is our A cover. And then we have a photo B cover. All right, I'd like to remind everybody that the last issue of Batman Killing Time is also out as of Tuesday. So this is the finale to Tom King's latest six issue series. And I read it and what I will say is it turns out, you will find out, there is another Batman villain who actually was behind a lot of this. And when you figure out, when you hear which villain it is, it makes complete sense, not just to the story, but also how the story has been told. 
So that that's oh, my. I might have an idea. Yeah, that's my hint there. Uh, otherwise, everything gets finished. I mean, there's so much in this, but I'm just gonna spoil anything if I tell you anything. I mean, it's the last issue. Yeah. You're either reading it or not, but you will know everything by the end of this. So Batman Killing Time comes to an end, and we have this awesome Kill New variant for that. Also want to remind you that we have DC versus Vampires number 8 of 12. So we are, uh, you know, in the back half of DC versus Vampires. This is a very good issue where we're getting um, kind of all of our pieces pulled together wherever they are as they are forming teams. You can see on the cover we've got Black Canary and Green Arrow. They have some really good moments in this, as well as really um, fleshing out Batgirl's character in this. I think is really really cool because you know the the big lord of the vampires in this is nightwing and what does that mean for barbara gordon um who is very very close to nightwing so that is also really good in this and then we have this uh, i can never pronounce his name uh sverdy variant it's the s v e r d y variant but really nice batgirl cover that girl, is, she's kind of stealing Huntress's thing, though. Uh, yeah, she's got the, the handheld crossbows. Yeah, when you hold up two crossbows like that confidently, <laughs> you're, you're Huntress. Um, so I've been through my books, but I, I missed one of the incentives. I, I just was in the wrong spot. I wanted to show this. So oh, wow. Harley Quinn, number 18, has this really cool 1 in 25 Rose Besh variant we're selling for $35. So again, this is the 1 in 25 Rose Besh variant for Harley Quinn. Issue 18. And then my final one is Batman Superman World's Finest number four, second printing. This time we have the full color cover with that uh, kind of new version of composite Batman and Superman, who with as popular as uh, this character was just briefly in this issue, I think uh, we'll be seeing more of him in the future so yeah, i've had a lot of customers come in and ask they're like do you think they'll bring them back i really hope they'll bring this character back and i'm like i have no control over this <laughs> but such a cool design i mean we'll see if anything they'll make a whole separate universe where that's just the main character there <laughs> all right well that is our show for today so thank you for tuning in we hope we have done our job in telling you more about these comics so that when you go to your store Whatever day of the week you do, you are not overwhelmed with the amount of comics and choices. We just went through 28 different comics, all their variants and all the incentives. So, whew. It's a lot. Yes. But there's some good stuff this week. Mm -hmm. So we'll be back on Friday with our show Comics from the Future where we go over all the comics that are available to order. And uh, then, of course, we'll be back next Monday with this show again. <laughs> so if you watch us on YouTube, please hit subscribe. We appreciate that. We're heading towards 1,800 subscribers. So everyone who does that just gets us there a little, little quicker. And so. we always tease stuff, but we do have some really cool stuff coming uh, to all of our videos. So yes, yes. Stay We're tuned. We're always working on more things behind the scenes. And uh, for those of you who've been watching our Whatnot shows where we do comic sales, Megan will be on Whatnot tonight at 7 p.m. So look for her there. She'll even be selling some of these books, Ooh. actually. Yeah, it's her, what she called her old and new show. Something old and something yeah, new. Yeah, something old and something new. So she does comics that haven't even released yet and incentives. And then she'll also do some, like, Silver and Bronze Age stuff. Yep. It's, it's a pretty cool show. All right, well, thank you, and we will see you next time.